Recently, wireless pioneer George Fearheller was honored by the Greater Toronto Marketing Alliance for a lifetime in business and charity at a gala at Toronto's Four Seasons Hotel. We got a chance to talk to Fearheller before the dinner and to present him with the first ever Computer World Canada IT Leadership Award for Lifetime Achievement. Mr. Fearheller, very much an honor to speak to you here. Um, you were with IBM in the punch card days. How sm small and inexpensive and powerful did you think computers could be then? Well, in those days, remember that punch card equipment was all electromechanical, absolutely amazing equipment, but it was huge. You know, the pieces might be three, four, or five feet long and that sort of thing. So when you started to see computers come in, they weren't much better. I remember the first computer that we installed was something called an IBM 650, and it came in about three great big boxes, huge boxes. And uh, at that point, I don't think anybody thought computers were going to be very small. But once transistors came in, that whole thing changed, and gradually the intelligence that you could build into one of these integrated chips was unbelievable. I remember giving a talk back, and oh, it must have been about 1970, saying that it should be possible at some point to build intelligence into anything you wanted, a chair or you pick it, because you could easily get a chair that would pick up a little radio signal from you and adjust itself move the back, move the seat up, whatever it was, just whatever you had built into that whole thing. Should be an easy thing to do. Hasn't quite got there yet, but it will. In 1983, uh, you won the Spectrum licenses uh, for Cantel and, and Rogers to create a nationwide mobile phone network. Um, the government held off for 18 months to ensure there was at least two networks, that there were competition for the wireless signals. Um, what were those months like? Well, they were very valuable because you've got to remember when they took that licensing procedure, they had it so that the Bell, BCTEL, AGT, the telephone companies, the Telcos, knew that they were going to be winners of half the spectrum. So they could start building right away. The outside bidders couldn't, of course, because they didn't know they were going to win. Only one person was going to win. So we went back to the Minister of Communications because Bell announced about uh, three months or four months after the license had been awarded that they were all set to go. And I went back to uh, Francis Fox, who was the minister at that time, and said, this is absolutely unfair. Uh, we, we couldn't build because we didn't know we were going to get the licenses. He looked at it and he said, I agree with you. So we're going to give you 18 months, and we won't let them start for 18 months which in the 18 months came from the fact that we had said it would take us that long to build the initial network. So it worked out well for us. Did, did that seem to signal a, a significant change in, in regulatory policy towards uh, the, tele, the uh, telecommunications industry? Oh, absolutely. Remember, this is the first time that they had ever licensed a national telephone company. Cantel, as it was called then, was the only company that could go anywhere in the country, coast to coast. The other companies just operated in select areas. Maritime Tel and Tel just operated in the Maritimes and things like that. So this was a major breakthrough in itself. And then it was also a breakthrough that they actually allowed a new company to enter the field and to be treated as a telephone company. Initially, the existing telephone companies wanted us treated as a customer. So we just buy facilities from them and so on. We said, no, no, we are a legal, regulated telephone company, and therefore we have the right to our own switches, set up our own microwave, and all these kinds of things. So yes, it was a big, big breakthrough. And it has led to, um, I mean, a significant number of players in the space now. Um, we had a similar market in the 90s uh, with you know, ClearNet and Microcell and lots of small, smaller niche players. Um, do you see the market consolidating again, or, or has the competitive landscape like shifted fundamentally? The public always wants to see more competition because they feel it'll drive down the prices, and they're probably right. But what usually happens is these smaller companies start up, and just as happened in Microcell and ClearNet and some of the others, and because it's such a competitive business in terms of the capital it's required to make the bills, build up your network, and so on, they can't really afford to stay in that business. So eventually what happens is the larger players buy the smaller players out and you're sort of back where you started. And frankly, I would predict the same thing is going to happen again. In 1983, um, was there a vision of, of a mobile phone that was actually a computer 
rather than just a phone or a computer that makes phone calls and of such ubiquity of the number of smartphones, I mean, eclipsing the number of home phones, if not this year, then possibly the next. I'd love to say that I foresaw all that, and I really didn't. As a matter of fact, I remember suggesting that, you know, the phones were getting smaller and smaller all the time, and sooner or later, you'd have a phone the size of that pen. You know, it's about the, the length of an antenna and so on. That would be just fine. You could have it voice activated so you didn't have to dial anything. You have a little uh, earpiece and if you wanted it and that sort of thing. I said that that would be the way it was going to go. It never went anywhere close to that. Well, you can't have apps on that. Well, exactly. And what the customers wanted was more functionality. Oh, they wanted everything from ringtones to full motion video to download of movies to all these kinds of things. And they wanted keyboards and everything. So that's the way it went. So it never went to the little tiny phones like that. Uh, it just went to things that had lots of functionality. You're being honored tonight as much uh, for your community efforts as your business success. Those efforts uh, on behalf of the uh, Greater Toronto Marketing Alliance, the Board of Trade, also organizations like the Council for Business in the Arts and Sunnybrook and Women's uh, Health Hospital, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Was there one morning you woke up and realized that you're a philanthropist? Oh, I wake up occasionally, and my wife will always put me in my place. And she says, you have not ever learned to say no. You know, your, your grandchildren, they'll say no. No, I don't want to do that or something. You never say that. You should listen to them because they've got the right idea. I just for years have always said, that sounds like an interesting idea. Why don't you do it this way? And the next thing you know, of course, they're you're involved in the organization, the next thing you know, you're probably running it on the volunteer base or something like that. That's a bad habit I've got into, but I haven't been able to break it in about 40 or 50 years, so it's probably too late now.